Hello everybody, Zach Couples, physical therapist here, and if you're someone who's been dealing with chronic pain, or you have clients who've dealt with chronic pain, and you've been searching this channel to try to find the answer, this video is for you. But I have to say, I'm about to have a very difficult conversation with you, and many of you might not be ready to hear this conversation, and that's okay. Like, if no one watches this, I'm totally okay with it, but it needs to be said. And so if you're, if you're not ready for a difficult conversation surrounding your pain that I think you need to be able to eclipse persistent pain and move on to pain freedom, then just watch this video right here. I've had a couple people ask me, because obviously I'm a little bit nuts in terms of the biomechanics side of things, and they say, Zach, how do you dive into this stuff without getting overly obsessed about how you look or if you have certain movements or not, or if you're exhibiting this certain posture or not, how do you create this dichotomy that you can learn about this stuff, but not necessarily go down a negative path with it? And what inspired me to talk about this was actually a patient of mine who I had just seen recently. And I've been working with this gentleman and his uh, girlfriend for some time, and I hadn't seen him in a couple years. And they came to me because they were in town in Vegas and wanted to get an assessment. I said, sure, why not? Let's see what's going on. Both of these clients would be classified as persistent pain. They've been dealing with pain for long-standing periods of time, greater than three months, definitely been a couple years, have worked with a wide variety of practitioners to try to get some improvements, but haven't really gotten over the hump. But when I saw them, both of them were actually doing very well. Both of them had significantly reduced uh, amounts of pain, were able to get back into training in the gym with few issues, and just generally seem to be happier and in better spirits. And I asked them, I said, man, it's been a couple of years. What have you guys done in order to essentially get over the hump on this? And the answer was they just went for it. They started training. They stopped consuming a crazy amount of biomechanical content, among other things. They dealt with some of the mental aspects that go on with persistent pain, so looking at mindset changes, doing things like headspace, meditation, things like that, and have gotten significant results. And although their training, which they did on their own, was fairly biomechanically sound, they were able to make a significant larger amount of progress compared to when they were focusing on addressing these asymmetries and biomechanical issues to the degree that they were. And although I was super excited for their progress, it really made me sad in a way because these two individuals are just a few of people who are in a similar headspace that have had success. Very few people get over the hump. Very few people recognize that the rate limiting step to them being in persistent pain and moving on towards pain freedom is likely some of their self-limiting beliefs and habits and thought processes that they've developed while being in persistent pain. In the individuals who don't get over the hump, they're the ones who stay stuck looking for one type of fix, whether it's the, if they could just get into this one position, if they could just restore hip internal rotation, if they could just get palatal expansion and get their tongue on the roof of the mouth, and they continue to research what is going to be the key that's going to get me out of pain, ultimately that's going to be the process, the mindset, the superpower that's going to be the limiter from ensuring their success in achieving pain freedom. It's the obsession and the hyper-focus and hyper-vigilance on feeling a certain way, learning about certain things surrounding the pain experience, among other things, that oftentimes keep people stuck in this never-ending, self-perpetuating feedback loop of persistent pain. And the reason why I know this is because I'm one of you. And when I say that I'm one of you, I'm talking about the tendency towards obsessing over things. Unfortunately, I've been in persistent pain only one time in my life. It was about a six month time period where I had groin and abdominal pain. But 
the obsessiveness is something that has bled into my life in many ways. And in some aspects, it can be a superpower because obsessing about certain things is what's led me to excel as a physical therapist. It's what helps me learn in-depth topics, uh, whether it's pain, whether it's biomechanics, whether it's anything. And on that side, it's good. Uh, the neutral aspect of the superpower might involve me watching a movie that I really liked, and then I go to IMDb and I learn every little thing surrounding the movie. But on the negative side, this superpower has led me to deal with eating issues, body dysmorphia, uh, difficulty with certain relationships, uh, obsessing over negative thoughts that you know impair me from doing my day-to-day -day tasks, or even, even obsessing about people leading to uh, unhealthy relationships. And so it's a power that I think a lot of us who deal with things like persistent pain or really any, any factor um, can wield to our advantage to help do wonderful things in the world. But if we get stuck on the wrong stuff, and that could be obsessing about the fix for our pain, which is so easy to do in this day and age because information is so free and abundant without a filter, or just being stuck wanting to feel a certain way. And it is this superpower, folks, that if you're someone who's in persistent pain has to come to grips with and use in a productive manner. Because as much as I love biomechanics movement, among other things, it's not the sole cause nor likely the sole fix of dealing with persistent pain. Check out this slide here from my pain talk, which uh, I'll link in the description below. If you sign up for my newsletter, you can check it out. But these are just a few of the factors that can contribute to someone dealing with persistent pain or disability. If you have any fear surrounding your condition, anxiety disorders, if you catastrophize, meaning, oh, I hurt myself and I'm going to be like this forever. Uh, your gender can influence pain levels, age, personality type, which is kind of what we're talking about here, environment you're in, uh, if you've had a history of pain, adverse life events, depression, which is big. Um, genetics, epigenetics, and there's a lot of others. In fact, um, I did some research for a talk um, that showed links to sleep disorders having a causal role in someone's pain experience. And you notice what I didn't write on here, folks, was, was biomechanics, was movement variability, was whether or not you can expand your rib cage the way that you want. It's complicated. And although complication might make it seem like, oh gosh, there's so many things to address, I don't know where to start, it can also be freeing in a way because there's also many different potential paths to success in achieving pain freedom. There's this great book that I read uh, recently by Dr. Aziz Gazaspura called Not Nice, uh, which you definitely check it out, it's awesome, especially if you're someone who tends to being a people pleaser. Um, but, but in this book, he actually talks about when he was having a persistent pain issues, was diagnosed with ankylosing spondylitis, couldn't move, couldn't exercise, sound familiar? And had seen everyone, went to a ton of different practitioners, tried several different treatments, among other things. And it wasn't until he had a mindset change within himself, instead of focusing on pleasing others, focusing on himself, admitting that he's good enough, accepting who he is, that he was actually able to overcome his long-standing pain just from a shift in mindset and changing the way that he felt about himself. It had nothing to do with improving his hip and thoracic mobility. So my point by bringing up that story is there's so many ways that you can achieve pain freedom that we just can't be laser-like focused on only one thing, in this case, biomechanics. And so what do we do, Zach? Should we stop consuming your YouTube channel and just go ahead and grab Calm or Headspace, meditate, and hope for the best? Well, it doesn't mean that the biomechanics stuff doesn't play a role or can't be useful. In fact, when I saw these two folks who had overcome a big hump in their persistent pain, we did a lot of biomechanics stuff, and they seemed to get even better. I'm not saying that at all. Plus, my intros are getting pretty sick, so you should probably at least watch those. But what I am saying is we likely have to broaden our focus on 
the multitude of other factors that we could be addressing that could potentially enhance our ability to get out of long-standing pain. Because we really don't know which variables are going to get us over the hump. But I think there is one major variable that you can address today that involves altering your obsessive superpower that you and I both share, that I think is going to be a crucial step to getting you over the hump and in towards pain freedom. And that, folks, is establishing a purpose in your life that goes beyond pain freedom. There was a seminar I took several years back by Dr. Brian Walsh, who's a naturopath. Definitely check him out. Like, if you wanna learn anything physiology or uh, functional medicine, he's the guy. But he had one lecture in his course that really stood out to me, and, and it was on purpose and community. And in this talk, he said, even though someone could maybe in a situation where they're dealing with social isolation, which has a lot of negative health risk factors, if that person has a purpose that is greater than them, could be a job, could be a religion, could be a lot of different things, they're actually going to have an increased lifespan and a decreased disease risk. How cool is that? You don't change anything else, but you establish a purpose in your life and you've automatically made your health better. And this is where I think a lot of individuals who are in persistent pain, who are focusing solely on how to get out of pain or some of their biomechanical stuff or nutrition or whatever it is that these individuals obsess with, I think that right there is the largest rate limiting step that's preventing you from getting to the next level. You have to shift your purpose. It can't be just about getting out of pain. There has to be other things in your life that you can bring that obsessiveness, that hyper focus towards. And until you have that, you're probably gonna be stuck where you are. And it might seem daunting because if you're someone in pain, you're probably thinking, well, Zach, I can't really do anything whatsoever. How in the heck am I going to establish a purpose? And, and this could be anything, really. It could be your purpose is being a good spouse or a parent. Your purpose could be establishing some type of business. And, and maybe you can't be up doing manual labor, but maybe you could do stuff on the computer. Maybe you could produce content. Maybe you can learn how to code. Maybe it can be something, anything that goes beyond learning in-depth biomechanics, which really should just be reserved mostly for practitioners and coaches. Is there something within yourself? Or it could be religion, I don't care. But is there something that you can find that you can focus on that's bigger than you, that's bigger than how you feel, that can make an impact on not just yourself, but others. That's probably the most crucial step that people need to do to really get out of longstanding pain. And it's what my two clients who, who did overcome that did. And it's what the clients who their pain is their purpose end up staying patients for long periods of time. And maybe not just with me, but with other providers. And it's tough. It's tough because having that shift in your purpose, which a lot of times can be deeply ingrained in who you are, can be one of the most difficult tasks to perform. But if you don't, you're likely going to be stuck in the state that you are in. And maybe you're not that ambitious. Maybe you don't want to have kids or you don't want to get married or you don't want to be an entrepreneur. You don't want to make content or learn a skill or anything like that. And that's okay. Perhaps there's something that's even easier that I would argue is essential to us as human beings that could start to create this shift. And that's finding some sense of community. Folks, when I took Dr. Brian Walsh's course, again, many years ago, he talked to us about the relationship between pro-social behaviors and social isolation and how that relates to inflammation. If you're in a pro-social situation, meaning that you're surrounded by a lot of people, you actually have a boost in your immune system's activity and a reduction in your inflammatory system's activation. Conversely, if you are socially isolated, 
those two things reverse. You have a less robust immune system and you have a much more robust or hyper aware or hyperactive inflammatory system. And if you think about this from like caveman days, it kind of makes sense. If I'm around a lot of people, people are gross. They spread germs. I need my immune system to be kicked into high gear so I don't catch various illnesses. Conversely, those same people can take care of me when I injure myself. And so the need to having a robust inflammatory response is less because people are going to tend to my wounds. Conversely, if I'm socially isolated, well, I'm not around as much people. So I really don't need a really extravagant immune response because I'm not going to be exposed to as many pathogens. Conversely, if I sustain an injury in the wild, I don't have anyone to take care of me. So I need that to heal up as quickly as possible. So in that situation, it makes sense that my inflammatory response would be much more robust. But we're not cave people anymore, folks. Yet the systems that benefited us back in the day are still in place. And so if we socially isolate ourselves, we're more likely to have higher amounts of inflammation within our bodies. And another common thing that I see with these individuals who hyper-focus on their pain or the way they feel is they also do not have a robust social community that they can latch on to. And this may be the first step that you can focus on if you're in this situation. Finding a friends group, finding a community where you share like-minded things, finding a friends group, finding a community of some sort that you can call on for support. And ideally, it's going to be in person. Because if you do that, folks, you get a twofer, as we say in the Midwest. You get the benefits of reduced inflammation by being surrounded by people who you like. And you also get to establish a purpose, which could be, I'm going to be a good person for this person who I care about. So perhaps the first treatment you need to do is go to Meetup or Bumble BFF or just talk to someone at a coffee shop. Anything you can do that promotes social behavior and allows you to be around people that you eventually will care about, I think is a critical step that a lot of people gloss over when they're dealing with being in long-standing pain. And to me, it can be one of the first steps that you can take that I think over the long term is ultimately going to help you be successful in achieving pain freedom. I hope that you found this talk useful. And if you didn't, I hope it at least just lights a little bit of a fire in you to start thinking about other things that could potentially help you along the way into moving better, feeling better, and ultimately claiming the life that you want. And regardless of if you like it, dislike it, whatever, I love you. I'm thinking of you. I'm here to support you and however I can. And keep moving forward because if you keep doing some of the good stuff that you're doing, my hope is that it gets you to where you want to be. Thank you so much for tuning in. You've been an incredible, outstanding audience. I hope that you keep it real, but not to the extent where things go wrong. Stay hungry, stay learning, stay moving. And I'll see you next time. Deuces.